nestled in the vast expanse of the Idaho desert, the SL-1 reactor, stood as a symbol of America's ambition to harness the power of the atom. On a frigid January night in 1961, that ambition would be met with tragedy, forever etching the name SL-1 into the annals of nuclear history. The stationary low-power reactor number one, known as SL-1, was a prototype. This small, three-megawatt experimental boiling water reactor, part of the Army nuclear power program, was designed to provide electricity and heat to remote military radar facilities. The vision was to power these remote outposts with small, compact, self-contained nuclear reactors. These outposts, part of the dew line, was the United States' first line of early warning defense against the incoming Soviet long-range bombers traversing the Arctic Circle. But on January 3, 1961, routine maintenance turned into a nightmare. The reactor had been shut down for the holidays. Now three operators were preparing it for restart. Previously gathered evidence indicated that on the night of the accident, the three-man crew was in the process of connecting the control blades to the drive mechanism when the excursion occurred. Direct cause of the accident clearly appears to have been manual withdrawal of the central control rod blade by one or more of the crew members considerably beyond the limits specified in maintenance procedure. The procedure was straightforward. Manually withdraw the control rods a few inches to reconnect them to their drive mechanisms. The control rods had a history of becoming stuck. At 9.01 p.m., one of the operators pulled the central control rod too far. This time it was fatal. The central control blade was lifted approximately 20 inches. This was three to four inches above its critical position of 16 to 17 inches. Approximately a 2% supercritical condition resulted, corresponding to a period of about four milliseconds. Within four milliseconds, the reactor went prompt critical with a power surging to nearly 20 gigawatts, 6,000 times its normal level. The heat was intense, rising to 1,300 degrees Fahrenheit instantly. Thus the spewing of hot vaporized fuel rapidly produced steam in the surrounding water. A water hammer effect slammed into the reactor vessel with a force of 10,000 pounds per square inch. The momentum of this water, as it struck the vessel head, transferred its energy to the reactor vessel, imparting a vertical motion to the shield plugs and to the vessel itself. Some biological shielding material was ejected from its container on the vessel head. The vessel jumped approximately nine feet. The force of the explosion was immense, shearing, connecting pipes, and scattering radioactive debris and internal parts of the core across the room. The shield plugs were launched like missiles. High pressure water and steam filled the operation chamber. The three men inside suffered horrific injuries from the blast, heat, and radiation. One operator standing on top of the reactor was impaled by a shield plug and pinned to the ceiling. The other two were fatally injured by the blast and the deadly radiation. Richard L. McKinley, a trainee, received a fractured skull, a severed hand and forearm, and massive internal injuries. He also suffered severe burns and intense radiation exposure. He survived initially, but died two hours later from his injuries in the back of an ambulance. Nurse Helen Lyson tried to save his life, but was unsuccessful. She died a few years later from cancer due to her close proximity to McKinley's highly contaminated body. Specialist John A. Burns, who was manually raising the control rod on top of the reactor, was thrown violently upwards. He suffered massive trauma to his lower body with a dislocated knee, a fractured femur, and internal organ damage. His heart was pierced by a broken rib and died instantly. Richard Legg, the shift supervisor who was also positioned on top of the reactor when the explosion occurred, was directly exposed to the full force of the blast and suffered the most traumatic injuries. Control Rod 7 was launched into Legg's body, piercing his groin and traveling through his torso, exiting his shoulder and pinning him to the reactor building's roof like a doll on a cork board. His body, the most contaminated of the three technicians, had radiation readings of up to 400 ronchens per hour. His body remained impaled to the ceiling for over five days while the dangerous process of decontamination and removal took place. 
A team of 10 men working in pairs and limited to 65 seconds of exposure each used hooks to pull his body free from a shield plug. Once the bodies were removed, the autopsies were conducted under extreme conditions. Pathologists working from behind lead shielding utilized long-handled tools and even electric saws to perform the procedures quickly as time was critical to minimize exposure. The bodies of the three men were then transported in lead coffins on rail lines as hazardous cargo. They were delivered to their families and entombed into the earth where they remain, still emanating lethal doses of radiation for centuries. The decontamination of the SL-1 site was a complex process that took a significant amount of time and resources. The initial cleanup of the SL-1 site took approximately 24 months. This involved removing the bulk of the contaminated debris and burying it. The burial ground was constructed about 1,600 feet from the original site. The entire reactor building contaminated materials from nearby buildings, and the soil and gravel contaminated during the cleanup were buried there totaling over 99,000 cubic feet of highly radioactive material. The SL-1 accident is a somber testament to the immense power and dangers of atomic energy, an example of humans' early attempts to harness the power of a star into a bottle. It is a crucial lesson in the importance of safety and vigilance for any attempt to bend the forces of the universe to the will of man. The SL-1 accident was a profound tragedy, but from its nuclear ashes, rose a renewed commitment to safety, a commitment that continues to shape the nuclear industry today.